So let's set up the conversation here for the forward rate agreement or the FRA. The forward rate agreement is an OTC contract over the counter. That means it's a dealer market. That's it's not exchange traded. So we're talking about uh, um, the average retail uh, investor does not have access to this market. We're talking about big, big institutions that are playing in this market. So what happens? The contract sets a fixed rate now. Sex sets a fixed rate now for borrowing or lending some dollar amount L, the loan, some dollar amount during some future time period. So here we are today. We're going to enter into an FRA which has a rate R, K for contract. It should be C, but that confuses it with continuous compounding. So K for contract. So RK, the rate in the contract that's agreed on. That's a rate agreement. We're going to agree on this rate. And the rate that we agree on is going to be applied to some money borrowed during this period of time. In other words, we're going to enter into an agreement today for a rate that applies to some amount of money L that will be either borrowed or lent in one year and paid back in a year and a half. So it's for six months. So that's what a forward rate agreement will do. That's the basic uh, a thesis behind it is, listen, let's agree on, I, I'm going to borrow money in a year for six months. And I like the forward rate. So let's agree. I'll make an agreement with somebody else. You need two parties to this. You need a lender and a borrower. Every, every OTC contract, every derivative contract needs two people. And remember, every derivative contract is a zero-sum game. So the lender's gain is the borrower's loss, vice versa. <clears throat> we'll agree on a rate today for this period of time. Now we've already calculated forward rates. So it would be easy to calculate based on what a one year investment is and what a one and a half year investment is or a two year investment, let's say, uh, one year and a two year compounded semi-annually. We can calculate what the uh, one year rate, uh, forward rate is from T1 to T2 plus one. And then we could just divide by two to get the semi-annual rate. So we can figure that out. The rate in the forward rate agreement need not be the forward rate, by the way, but we'll assume for now that it's the forward rate, that we're going to go with the forward rate. So let's have a look at, the, uh, at what the lender is doing. The lender will lend L. The lender will lend L and will earn the forward rate, R. Okay. But the lender could have earned. This is important now. The lender could have earned, without the agreement, the lender could have earned whatever uh, the market rate was at that time. Could have earned RM. So by entering into the forward rate agreement, the lender is saying, I'm locking in RK, but I could have earned RM. So I can't say that I'm earning RK because I'm not, because I could have earned RM anyways, I'm earning the spread, only the spread between RK and RM. That's all I'm earning by entering into this agreement. Now, a lender would not enter into this agreement if they believe that this spread were zero or negative. The lender would say, I, I, why would I enter into an agreement if I feel the rate that I will earn is less than what I could have earned? So the lender is motivated to enter into a forward rate agreement because they believe that the rate in the contract is going to be greater than what the market rate is going to be at that time. They're motivated by that belief. So they're going to lend L for uh, RK minus the RM, so whatever excess spread. But how long are they going to lend it for? Well, they're going to lend for this long. And the length of period of time is uh, T2 minus T1. So here we have one and a half years minus one year is half a year. So remember, if you're going to have an interest rate, you have to multiply the interest rate by the period of time. So all we have here, while it looks daunting, it's the investment we had, how much money multiplied by the, the interest rate we're going to earn. And in this case, we're only interested in the spread because we could have earned the RM anyways. I mean, we could have earned that anyway. So we're really only interested in the spread. Uh, the amount of money times the spread, and then, of course, multiplied by the period of time. If it's only three months or six months, uh, then it's not, the, uh, it's not L times this. It'll be some fraction of that, right? 
So this is what the lender looks like. The lender will lend a certain amount of money for a certain rate uh, above whatever the market rate is or different from the market rate for a certain period of time. What will the borrower look like? The borrower, on the other hand, will borrow. And we'll find that as you write these out, when we get especially to options, uh, you'll find that uh, when we want to know the other side of the contract, it's just a matter of reversing one term. The uh, um, borrower will borrow L, so it's the same, but the borrower could have paid. The borrower could have paid the market rate, but the borrower will pay instead RK. So, from the borrower's point of view, what this is saying is that they are motivated to enter into the contract if they believe that the rate that they're agreeing to is going to be less than the rate that they pay. They would never enter into a contract if they believed that the rate in the agreement is going to be more than what the market rate will be at that time. So while the lender is motivated to enter into the contract because they believe that the contract rate will be greater than the market rate, the borrower is motivated to enter into the contract because they believe the market rate will be greater than the contract rate. And remember, when we're uh, putting things in brackets, well, maybe I didn't explain it uh, um, in, uh, when we got to the, the derivatives, is that we tend to want to put things in brackets in such a way that our belief will be a positive outcome. So RK, we believe, in, in this case, what we're saying is we implicitly believe RK will be greater than RM, and here the borrower believes that RM will be greater than RK. One of them will be wrong, but to set the payouts, this is how this is sort of, sort of what we follow along with. Well, uh, uh, it'll be for this long, right? T2 minus T1. So notice that the L's match off because that's what they're borrowing. The time periods are the same because they're borrowing for the same and lending for the same time period. And the payoff of one over here, this is either an excess or a deficiency. And that's the spread. Must be matched off over here. So if we have an excess, we have a deficiency. And if we have a deficiency, we'll have uh, um, an excess. And that will be their spread. The sum of the two spreads equals zero. So let me see if I can give you a nice way to, uh, to think about this so that you can understand how the uh, FRA um, has value uh, in, for, for the lender and the borrower. So what we have here, let's just rewrite the agreement we have here. Here's our lender. The lender lends to the borrower, lends a certain amount of money at an agreed on rate, RK, for some future period of time, for some duration. So they're going to lend uh, a sum of money at an agreed on rate. Uh, this loan will occur at some future time for some future uh, defined period. And that is what the borrower is going to borrow. Here's the thing. It's not called a forward loan agreement. It's called a forward rate agreement. They're not agreeing to lend each other money. The lender is not agreeing to lend money to the borrower, and the borrower is not agreeing to borrow money. They're agreeing at a rate at which they would lend and borrow. They're agreeing at the rate. It's called a forward rate agreement. The lender and the borrower are not entering into a loan agreement. They're entering into a rate agreement. So why would they bother to enter into a rate agreement? What's the point? Well, the point is a belief. The lender uh, in this agreement, uh, the, the one side of the contract, uh, is going to receive RK. Now, if... The, the lender believes that the rate in the contract is going to be greater than the market rate, what the lender will do will then go out and borrow in the market, will borrow X dollars, sorry, I want to keep it consistent, will borrow the L dollars in the market at whatever the market rate is for the same period of time. 
So they'll borrow at RM for T2 minus T1 and invest that money. And they'll invest it at RM. They'll invest the money at RM. But they believe that RK was higher. So if they were going to engage in an investment at some future period of time, at, at time T1, if they were going to engage in an investment, and they we didn't want to take the chance that the rate would be worse than what they thought, they could look at the forward rate and they could say, you know what, the rate in the contract in this forward rate agreement is higher than the rate that I'm going to get when I invest, so I'm going to do this. So the lender believes that they're going to earn RK for that period of time and that RM will be less. The borrower, on the other hand, is going to buy an investment, uh, is lending uh, the same dollar amounts uh, at RM, will lend at the market rate uh, for uh, the same period of time. And from the borrower's point of view, they believe that the rate in the contract is too low that the market rate will be higher. So the borrower arranges the rate at the lower rate and will lend the money out at the higher rate and make the spread. The lender, on the other hand, believes that, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to lend at the higher rate and I'm going to borrow at the lower rate to, uh, to, to invest because I'll get a lower rate, but I'll make it up here. I think this is the higher rate. So the contract pays either the excess or the deficiency of what their belief is in the other things that they're doing. That's a forward rate agreement. It's not a forward loan agreement. Let's be clear about that. The lender and the borrower here are just placeholder names. You could have called it party A and party B, but it's hard to figure out who's on what side of the contract. Call it the lender and borrower. But they're not actually lending and borrowing to each other. They're just agreeing on a rate to lend and borrow. But the loan will never happen, only the rate will happen, and not the rate will happen, only the spread over the market will actually happen. So there'll be a payoff from the lender to the borrower. That leads into our next conversation.